I'd like to invite you to please stand up with your book in hand. We're going to be reading from the book, from James chapter 4. We'll read only chapter, verse 4 to 6 from what our dear brother Cedric read to us. James chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. It goes like this. Please read with me. Adulterers and adulteresses. Go ahead and read with me. Do you not know that friendship, let me hear you, with the world is enmity with God. Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Verse 5. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace, therefore, verse 6, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's bow our heads before the Lord and commit this day, commit this moment, commit this time to him that he may speak, address our needs, and address any issue in our life that is not pleasing to him that we may be willing to rectify it and willing to be obedient and pleasing in his sight. Father, we came here because we want to renew our friendship with you. There are areas in our lives where we may have slipped. We may have been lured. We may have been, Lord, weakened by our own fault because of our persistence in manners and in friendships of this world. Today, cure us from this and help us to humble ourselves, to repent, and to turn back to the one who says, I want to be your friend. What a privilege that we can befriend God. How could we, for a moment, neglect that friendship and befriend the world that hates God? Please, Lord, help us today to cleanse our ways, humble ourselves, and to come back before you and renew this friendship with you, Lord, our God, our Savior, our Redeemer, our friend. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Hallelujah. There are many dangers for a Christian. One big danger for a Christian is to become friend of the world. That's right. This is a big danger that is luring around, trying to distract us, trying to attract us, trying to make us become enemies of God. You say to me, I'm going to become an enemy of God. The Bible says that you can become an enemy of God if you befriend this world that hates God. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. That is something very important for us to dwell upon, we Christians who have become friends of God. To continue in habitual, ungodly friendship with the world inevitably results in problems. Problems. Conflicts. Conflicts with yourself. Conflicts with others. But conflict mainly with God. To become a friend of the world will make you to be in conflict with one another. Do you know the Bible says in James chapter 4 verse 1, where do wars and fights come from among you? Where do they come from? They come because you have been seduced by the ways of this world. What is normal fighting in the world becomes regular fighting within the people of God if they are walking in the ways of the world. Not only that, but they will be also fighting with yourself if you are walking in the ways of the world. Look, 
It says, do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Verse 2. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. People who are walking according to the ways of the world are people who usually do not pray. And by befriending the world and becoming enamored with their methods, you stop praying. You do not ask and therefore you do not get. And when you do ask as a worldly person who has been lured in the ways of the world, verse 3 says, and you ask but you do not receive. Why? Because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Your prayers become selfish. Worldly. When you walk in with the world, you begin acting like the world. You begin wanting, praying for pleasures of the world. Instead of praying for holiness and for righteousness of God, you begin praying for those things that God does want you to have. And you don't get it because you're asking for it in a selfish manner. I want to tell you, you say to me, is this going on in the world too much today? I want to tell you the simple fact that there are so many now psychiatrists and psychologists trying to fix the matters of this world tell you that this world is becoming more and more worldly and the church itself is being lured into the manners of the world. As many worldly people who are spending time trying to fix their brains there are also Christians now who are trying to fix their brains. They think they can fix their brains with psychologists, psychiatrists. And then we see more and more Christians getting into drug addictions, domestic violence and abuse, crimes, alcoholism, suicide. All are giving abundant evidence that the world ways have gone into the church. Watch out. Because if you go in the manner of the world... You are turning yourself into an enemy of God. You, are being become, you have become slave to your passions, to your lusts. And uh, in 2 Peter chapter 2, I'll read to you this, those, those very frightening words. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, he says, he says, and these people who claim that they are Christians, but really they are worldly people, these people, in verse 17, they are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words, by the way, I decided to give you also the pages. If you want to turn to Second Peter chapter 2, that's page 1396. Page 1396. And you can read with me. That way I can give you the same page as I'm reading in the book. The same book, the same page. 1396, it says, These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise, verse 19, while they promise them liberty, you see, they come and start speaking about, oh yeah, God allows us to do everything. Nothing is a sin. Everything is fine. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. Verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world to the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again what? Entangled. They are taken as captives of their own in them and overcome the latter end is worse for them than the beginning and verse 20 says for if after they have escaped the pollution of the world verse 20 the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ they are again entangled in them and overcome the latter end is worse for them than the beginning verse 21 says for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. There is nothing worse than a Christian who is living in the world. 
The Bible says you would have been better off not being saved. Because you would be just immersed in sin. You wouldn't know the difference. But there's nothing worse than a Christian who be, has become worldly. Who befriends the world and the ways of the world. He's a very, a double miserable person. So the Bible says, worse than that, not only are you miserable when you befriend the world, you have become an enemy of God. That's right. Look. James chapter 4 verse 4 says, Adulterers and adulteresses. Don't you know that friendship with the world is what? Is enmity with God. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. An adulterer. Adultery is betraying the covenant of marriage and having sexual intimacy with someone else than your spouse. That's what adultery is. Of course, James is speaking about spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. It happened to God's people throughout the ages. God said about Israel that she is an adulteress. Why Israel? Because that's his people. They were supposed to be in a covenant marriage with God. But they went after other gods. They went after the ways of the world. They left God. They turned their backs to God. And they went after someone else. So he spoke about them in many places. Through Jeremiah. Through Ezekiel through Hosea and many other prophets. And he tells them in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 32, he said, you are an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. They turned to pagan gods, idols, or simply they went to the world. They said, let's live it up. Let's just be like the rest of the world. The rest of the unsaved world, they're having fun. We're going to have their same fun. Their methods, we want to apply them also. Spiritual adultery makes you an enemy of God. And this is what the Lord Jesus said also about Israel, unbelieving Israel of his days. He tells, says about them in Matthew 12, 39, it's an evil and adulterous generation. And this can be said about any Christian who begins being a Christian and then he says, you know what? I want to live it up the way of the world. I want to befriend the world and I want to do the things that the worldly people do. After all, I'm living in this world. Let me live it up. Because there is no middle ground, folks. You cannot have Friendship with God and friendship with the world. The same way that you cannot have two wives or two husbands. It's the same thing. I know there are people who think that they can, they can get away with it. But there is no middle ground. Either you're faithful to God and therefore you're not a friend of the world. Or if you are in both lands, you are committing spiritual adultery. Friendship is... A one-way direction. Either you direct your friendship toward God or you direct it toward the world. There is no middle ground. If you're trying to play the both ends, you are committing spiritual adultery. Friendship, philia. Friend, we derive from it the name in Greek, philos. And the Lord Jesus defined what a philos of his is. You want to be my philos? You want to be my friend? Said the Lord Jesus. In John chapter 15 verse 14. He says. You are my friends. If you do what I command you. You want to be a friend of Jesus? Obey Jesus. That's called friendship. Jesus says my true friends. They love me, they love one another, they love my word, they obey my word, and they are not friends with this world. 
My true friends are not friends of the world. In John chapter 15, verse 17, that's on page 1243 of your book. John 15 and verse 17, he says, Twelve forty-three of your book, John 15 and verse 17. He says, these things I command you that you love one another. And then verse 18 says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world, what? Hate you. Hates you. Folks, we have to accept the fact that the world hates Christians. Did you get it or not yet? You think that they love us? They hate us. Because they hate Jesus, they're going to hate you. Verse 20. Remember, the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Verse 21, all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know him who sent me. I like a verse of scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Timothy 3, 12, it says, and all those who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. I read that account that happened not long time ago about some soldiers that were bragging about this young lady they were raping in an afternoon time after time. While they were raping the girl, she was singing some funny evangelical songs. They were so annoyed by her singing while they were raping her that somebody took a gun and shot her in the chest. She kept singing. They shot her again and again. She kept singing evangelical songs. So they became afraid of her. They said, we cannot stop this girl from singing Christian songs. So they took their machetes and they started cutting her into pieces. And the singing stopped. And I want to tell you that for the last 2,000 years, there were many people who have been trying to stop the singing of Christians to the Lord. I want to tell you that in the last century, 20th century, it was estimated that more Christians died being persecuted and were martyred than any other century after Christ. You say to me, this happened in the past. No, it's ongoing, folks, right now. Right now, it is estimated that at least every year, 150,000 Christians will be martyred. Two million Christians, at least, are being persecuted on an ongoing basis. And I want to tell you, this world hates you if you are a true Christian. You said to me, what are you trying to tell me? I'm not trying to tell you to hate the world, but be aware of the fact that this world hates you. This world doesn't love you. Last week, you probably heard about this young man from UCLA who was shot, a professor. We found out that he was a born-again Christian who was witnessing to his students. And the guy who shot him was a Muslim. A few months ago, in Norway, you said to me, this happens only uh, occasionally here and there. It happens in some remote land. In Norway, a Western nation, several students from a school were taken away from their family home. They were found to be singing Christian songs in the school. The family is a Romanian Christian family. They were accused as a crime that they are forcing their children in Norway, this wonderful westernized country. They're forcing their children to learn Christian songs. Is this possible? 
the world hates Christians. The world hates you. How can we befriend a world that hates God, hates Christ, and hates us? I remember one time we were witnessing to, uh, to, to at uh, the Garden Grove. Do you remember when they had that uh, fair in Garden Grove? We would go and there was a tent, etc., and we would stand there, etc. I remember going because they were trying to stop us. So they asked me, they said, go and speak to the leaders of that uh, Muslim group. I remember a meeting with about three of them, and one guy took his finger at me like this. He was poking at me. He said, tell me, what are you trying to teach? I said, we're teaching about the love of God to you. We love you. And I'll never forget, he pointed his finger at me and put it in my chest said, and we hate you. <laughs> I repeated, I said, we love you. He said, and we hate you. The world hates Christians. Jesus Christ said, you will be persecuted by the world. You do not belong to this world. You are not of this world. So therefore, stop befriending this world. Stop thinking that you can uh, just, I want to do what they do and just, they hate you. The only thing you can do to this world is to bring them to Christ and tell them about the eternity that is awaiting them if they continue in that method. John, the apostle, commanded the Christians not to love the world. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, on page 1399 in your book, again, next time everybody will be walking with what? The book in your hand. 1399, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, verse 16, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Verse 17, and the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. This world is temporary. This cosmos, we're not talking about the physical world. We're talking about this sphere that is man-centered, that is Satan-driven, that hates God, hates the church, and hates the word of God. It is that world that you're not supposed to befriend and you're not to live their lifestyle or do their ways. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. There is no middle ground. You either befriend God or you befriend the world. Friendship with the world and friendship with God are mutually exclusive. You cannot have them both. You're either a friend of God or you're either a friend of the world. The apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, on page 1330 of your book, 1330 of your book, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, he says those very clear words that you cannot have it both ways. He says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship? What? You cannot mix oil and vinegar together. Have you noticed? You cannot mix them together. Yeah, they, they separate. What fellowship is has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ, verse 15, with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, verse 17, he says, Come, what? Would you read it with me? Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. We are not supposed to live the way they live and desire what they desire and immerse my, ourselves in their filth as they are filthy. We are different. Come out of them. And do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you in verse 18. It says, verse 18, it says, and I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. 
you want to experience this, this intimacy with God, come out from the world. Come out from the ways of the world. God wants to befriend us and you are a friend of God. Stop putting your foot again in the world, in the ways of the world. Many come to church, but their heart is in the world. I want to tell you, they are enemies of God, even in, as they are inside the church. Many don't come to church and they say, we're searching for God, but we cannot find him. But I want to tell you, God makes some liars because the Bible says there's none who seeks God. But you know, I want to tell you, many come to church, they're seeking something tangible from God. What can I get from him? Maybe they're looking for a job. They start coming to a church. They say, God is going to give us a job. A provision of some sort or like one day one guy came kept coming to church and finally he said the reason I'm coming because I have a son who is very sick and I heard that you people pray for my son and uh, shortly after his son was terminally ill he died so he said okay I don't need you anymore stop coming to church there are people who come to church to get something out of God they don't want God they want something out of God they don't want his forgiveness they don't want his friendship they just want to get something out of him these people are not friends of God. They're enemies of God. Listen, before salvation, we were all enemies of God. But after salvation, we have become friends with God through faith in Christ. It is said about Abraham in James chapter 2, verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted for him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Abraham became a friend of God because he believed God. And you have become a friend of God because you believed God. You believed him when he told you that you are a sinner and you believed him then he told you that Christ is your only salvation and method of forgiveness. You received Christ you believe God and you have become a friend of God. But I want to tell you, you cannot have God and then go back to your ways of the world. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot serve two masters. Lord Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. He says, no one can serve two masters. You can't. Either he will Ha hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other you cannot serve God and mammon you say to me what is mammon wealth and that is the centerpiece of the world the God of this world is not Baal it is mammon nowadays mammon you know they live for money that's it they're, they, they act for money. They live for money. They, their, their aspiration is money. They dream of money. They go to sleep thinking of money. They wake up thinking of money. They spend the whole day thinking of money, adding, subtracting. It's money, 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 money. And they go to, 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 they go to, their, to their death thinking of money. What are they going to do with money after they die, before they die, when, when they're living, etc. It's, it's all about money. This world is centered on that. You cannot serve God and serve money, which is the centerpiece of the world. You cannot be a friend of God and a friend of this world. You cannot. If you do, you're an adulterer. And you have become an enemy of God. You can be lured into this. You can be drawn into this. You can say, I'm doing it for a short while. But I want to tell you, there's danger in this. You have become an enemy of God. I want every one of us to stop and think because, you know, we can, be, we can slip into this every so often. You know, the world is very appealing, isn't it? It has lights and attractions and things like that and, and, and they lure us through bad friendships, bad companions, bad uh, company, uh, uh, people we encounter, etc. They want to lure us into their ways all the time. But the Bible says, watch out. I want to think, am I being a real friend of God? Have I slipped? Have I turned un into an enemy of him? Am I compromising? Have I gone into this sphere called cosmos, the world? It could be art. It could be science. It could be education. It could be culture. But in all that sphere, they hate God. And the name of Jesus Christ is forbidden. 
I remember once going to a uh, gathering, and the first thing they said to me is that, don't speak about Christ. And I told them, I'm leaving right now. They said, because here we don't like to hear about Christ. I said, well, you won't be seeing me anymore. And I'm glad I did that. Because where they hate your master, they're going to hate you. Where they refuse your master, they're going to refuse you. And if they're refusing your master, you should not be there in that place. Where the name of God is forbidden, unwelcome, this is the world. It is any group, any activity that is outside the church that hates God, that's the world. And we should not be friends with the world. So to begin with, friendship with the world will make you an enemy of God. You're compromising if you befriend the world. And the second thing is, friendship with the world makes you neglect the ways of God. Look at, with me at verse 5. Verse 5 of James chapter 4. It says, Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Scripture. If you regard scripture highly, if you say this is the word of God, you cannot be loving the world. The fact that you are loving the world will make you disregard scripture. Have you noticed? When you are on a low level of relation between you and God, the first thing that gets close is what? The Bible. You just turn the Bible and put it aside. And when the Bible comes alive, there goes the world and there is the friendship that becomes more intimate with God. Our God is jealous. The spirit that is in us is jealous. The same way a husband who sees his wife going to another man should be jealous. Or a wife who sees her husband going to another becomes jealous. God is jealous for our complete devotion Love of the world will lead you to disregard God's scripture. In fact, the fact that you're not reading your Bible enough or regularly is probably because you've been enamored by the ways of the world. I don't know, perhaps you spend more time on a TV show than reading the Bible. Perhaps it is a game, perhaps it's a friendship, perhaps it's an activity of some sort that is keeping you away. This is friendship with the world that's keeping you away from God and you have turned to become an enemy of God. And more than that, when you become an enemy of God and a friend of the world, you disregard God's favorite character. What is God's favorite character? Verse 6. But he gives more grace... Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to who? The to the humble. God loves humility. And when you love the world and befriend the world, you become proud. Proud. A proud person is someone who says, I'm above everybody else. It is someone who says, I'm independent. I'm my own God. A proud does not see his own sin. He cannot recognize it. And pride is the essence of all sins. And God hates pride. And because God hates pride, he will resist the proud. In another version it says, he will oppose the proud. Just as pride is the root of all sin, humility is the root of all righteousness. God wants us to be humble, dependent upon him. Constantly seeking his face. And when you befriend the world, you become proud, arrogant, and you think you got away with it and you can do without God. In closing, what is the solution for us on a constant basis? This is the solution. It says in James chapter 4, verse 7 to 10, the greatest call of God to solve all our problems. It goes like this. Therefore, submit what? to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You what? Double-minded. You have one foot with God, one foot in the world, one good, 
one befriend, one moment you befriending God, another moment you befriending the world. You are an adulterer. Stop this double mindedness. Verse ten, verse nine. I'm sorry. Lament and mourn and weep. I like it. I think sometimes we need to take a moment and look at our ways, our life, how we're walking with God, how much really are we faithful to God. And if there's some unfaithfulness in our lives, whatever it is, com compromising in our lives, neglecting scripture, neglecting to follow God's ways, befriending the world has become the habit in our lives. Coming to church is only an occasional thing. Reading the Bible is only occasional. Spending time confessing your sins has become occasional. We need to weep. Let their tear be tears of repentance coming from us. Verse 9 again. Weep. And then, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. God resists the proud. God hates pride. God loves humility and He gives more grace to the humble. God has grace and He has more grace. He has a little grace he gives it to everybody because he shines his sun on both the wicked and the righteous. He lets rain falls on both the bad and the good. This is grace. He offers salvation to everyone no matter how their sins, but he reserves his ample grace. The big hand of grace is only to those who are humble. Do you want a big grace? Do you want a big amount of grace? I'm sure you will tell me I want it. I want to tell you how you're going to get it. By humbling yourself. By declaring your unworthiness. By realizing your sin. By confessing it. By humbling yourself. This is the way God will pour his ample, big, great grace on you. And if you don't, he won't give it to you. He won't give it to you. You want special grace, you want ample grace, you want big grace, humble yourself. I don't know where those words find you. Do they find you like the publican who could not lift his eyes up and he took his hand and beat his breast and said, God be merciful on me, what? Sinners. A sinner. And the Lord Jesus said, this guy went down to his house justified, much better than the other guy who was proud. Or does it find you as a believer who strayed like Peter in Matthew 26 and verse 72, 71, who remembered on that day what the Lord Jesus told him that before the rooster crows, you would have denied me three times. And it says that Peter went outside and he did what? He wept. He cried bitterly. I don't know whether it finds you as someone who has not come to faith yet like the publican, or someone like who has come to faith like Peter but who denied his Lord three times. Either way, humble yourself. Humble yourself today. Confess it whether it's a sin that is preventing you from coming to Christ to be saved or it's a sin that has made you to be a friend of the world denying Christ. Because I want to tell you every time we befriend the world we're denying Christ. Have you denied him once? Twice? Or is it three times like Peter? Either way, Realize it. Stop. Ponder about it. And confess it to God in a humble way. And God says, I will then lift you up. I will forgive your sin. I will wipe it out. Because God is jealous for his com your complete devotion to him. He wants you completely. He deserves to have you completely. And he's the only person that you should really completely give yourself to. Befriending the world makes you an enemy of God. Have you befriended the world? Come, let us weep over it. And let us come and humble ourselves before our God today. Let's bow our heads in silence. Do not be deceived. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enemy, enmity with God? Whoever, doesn't matter who, wants to be a friend of the world, 
makes himself an enemy of God. Have you ever done that? Have you done that? Have you been a friend of the world? Have you, sway have you strayed away from God, from God's methods? Have you been compromising? Have you been hesitant? Have you been double-minded? Have, have you had a double standard in your life? Have you had one foot with God and one foot with the, uh, with the world? Have you been one hand with God, one hand in the world? Are you double-minded? Are you compromising? Today, lament and mourn and weep. Humble yourself and come back to God. God is jealous for your complete devotion to Him. He wants to start a new, fresh relationship with you. And He wants you today to come and humble yourself, declare your sin, your unworthiness before Him, and tell Him, Lord, I want to start a fresh day. No more double-mindedness. Completely to you. And only to you. And if you want to do that, I'd like to invite you to stand. Stand. Declare it before God and the angels. And tell Him, Lord, from this day on, I'm going to be completely yours. No one else but you in my life. I will obey your word. I will obey your voice. I will not look back. And I will not befriend this cosmos who hates you. Who hates your word. I will not live their lifestyle. I will not live their ways. I will not compromise. I will not be ashamed of you. I will declare you. This world hates me. This world hates you. And therefore, this world will persecute me. But Lord, thank you for telling me this, that I do not belong to this world. From this day on, I will not compromise. I belong to you completely, body, soul, and spirit. So be it, Lord. I'm yours from this day on. With heads bowed, eyes closed, I would like to ask Brother Labib Mubarak to close for us in this word. Then we're going to take an offering after Brother Labib speaks, uh, it finishes his uh, prayer. And then we'll hear another prayer from our dear brother Mark Biedbach. And then we'll close with a song.